Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we examine the consequences of COP26 in Glasgow. Was the much-delayed and much-heralded summit a success or failure? And is our planet saved or doomed? And do these times of crisis stimulate great art? We talked to two young artists, Natalia Katchuk and Sarah Klass, whose work has been inspired by the climate emergency. On the eve of the Glasgow summit, we asked Stuart Hazeldean, Professor of Carbon Capture and Storage at the University of Edinburgh for his hopes for the summit. Now he returns to the show to provide the expert rundown on the successes and failures of COP26. But first, she tweets, emails and messages in response to our show last week with Lord Sicca and Member of Parliament Angus Brendan McNeil. And in relation to the House of Lords, Andrew David Williams says, you mean what they're doing is wasting time? Taxpayers' money and effort doing things that Parliament has already rejected and will reject again. Charmaine Dahl says peers give added power. It can go on. There's been an extreme depletion in what integrity there was since the days of David Cameron. Margaret Peden says another excellent programme, a relaxed and mature interview thanks to Tasmina and Alex. And finally, William Nicholl, who says, please try and give steps of hope a mention, Alex and Tasmina. Always a brilliant show. I've been watching corruption in government for far too long now. They go into government with good intentions, I believe, but end up joining the cliques and cronies. Stay safe. Thanks again. Now over to Alex and Professor Stuart Hazeldean to analyse the impact of COP26. Professor Stuart Hazeldean, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Especially uh, at Christmas. Well, well, we're at Christmas, so... We want to know, was COP26 a, a Christmas present for the, the planet or, or was it a hangover? What's the, the balance between success and failure at this huge summit? Well, I went to the COP uh, several times, several days in Glasgow, and uh, I was quite surprised about the diversity of what goes on. So the actual uh, main part of negotiating of the COP uh, is the political part that's behind closed doors and that produced a mixed bag of results. The other part of the COP, the majority of people there uh, are really convincing each other of what they've done, what they can do, what needs to be done and in motivation and in civic society and trying to hold political leaders to account, that was a huge success, I think. So the, the mobilisation impact of uh, the Glasgow summit was, was considerable, uh, and that is an achievement given that you know, we're in times of COVID and, uh, and crisis. Uh, but the actual decisions that made, you describe them as a mixed bag. OK, what was good and what was bad? OK, so we'll start with the not so good. So and uh, Alex Sharma, the chair of the COP, UK chair of the COP, had laid out four things before people assembled in Glasgow. One was to come with better pledges to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from different countries. That was not a success. So very few countries turned up with extra pledges. Very few countries uh, made a big commitment, which wasn't already known. And so that is a problem, a major problem for the world in that before the COP, the world was heading for about three and a half degrees of global warming by uh, the end of the century. And we're still now heading for 2.7 degrees of global warming. So there was some progress, but nothing like enough. And I'll just remind the viewers that we've already had maybe just 1.1 degrees of warming, and that's clearly causing major disruptions in weather, uh, rainstorms, snow, uh, heat waves, forest fire. And so heading further into that territory is a really big problem. So that's got to improve in the next COP and the COP after that. The second type of thing um, was to ask countries for plans to adapt into climate change and very little activity was seen on that. Uh, but the third thing I think was, uh, was half achieved. There was better pledges on climate finance because the rich countries had agreed something like 10 or 11 years ago to pledge $100 billion a year and have never managed to meet that. So uh, it's got up to about sort of 60 or $80 billion a year, which is still a lot of money, but nothing like is needed to change the way the world operates. And so the money didn't arrive, but there was a, a very serious uh, conversation about paying differently next year or, or rediscussing that next year. So I'm optimistic that will happen. 
And one of several of the big things, which positive things which happened were uh, the, the fourth thing which Alok Sharma set out, the Paris rule book, let's say, because in Paris in 2015, the world came together and pledged to try and keep climate change below 1.5 degrees and definitely to keep it well below 2 degrees. And the rules for that have never been completely sorted out. And those were much better sorted out now, how to count carbon dioxide emissions between different countries, and particularly what's called Article 6, which is a rule about how to uh, how some countries can dispose of more carbon dioxide in their country and sell that extra stored carbon dioxide to a different country, which maybe is not quite so advantaged. So that was a big move forward. And then there were also, the interesting thing is, breakage into smaller groups, really, to not to ask the whole COP of 190 countries to decide on something, but groups of 30 or 40 countries, notably to discuss moving beyond coal, uh, which ended up being uh, to decrease coal, not to cancel coal. But I think that's a really important conversation because for the first time, countries started discussing decreasing the ability or decreasing the right uh, to extract fossil fuel out of the ground, unless that's mitigated by storing carbon dioxide. Uh, so that's started to converse, and I'm sure that will come back next year, and it'll be a short step from coal to asking oil and gas companies what they are doing about extracting oil and gas and how they're going to clean up their own emissions. And then another big step forward was to sign a pledge on methane emissions. Methane is uh, natural gas, we know it, but it occurs quite uh, from uh, extracted out of the ground and pipelined. And there are many leaks along those pipelines and there are many leaks in the gas distribution systems. And so that's a really powerful greenhouse gas. So restricting those leaks and reducing that methane impact by something like 40% by 2030 is a really strong climate action. And it's that agreement on methane, which uh, reduced the warming from about three and a bit degrees down to 2.7. So it wasn't anything to do with carbon dioxide, it was that methane agreement. So as a, a scientist uh, and a climate change expert, does this give uh, the scientific community huge frustration that the, 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 the world's on the brink of this precipice, but political leaders have a, a decision-making span that seems to, seems to be taking far, far too long? Yeah, and I think that frustration is felt by many people working professionally in that climate science community, but it's especially felt by the people in ordinary civic society, if you like, who've travelled from all over the UK to demonstrate and make their views known in Glasgow and indeed travel from many parts of the world to make their views known and report back from their experience of climate change. And so moving slowly is really a terrible option to take and because I mentioned earlier on that uh, as part of Paris, the world had agreed to try and keep climate change to less than 1.5 degrees of warming. And although there's lots of talk about keeping 1.5 alive as a slogan, in reality, that's going to be almost impossible because we need to decrease carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gases by 10% next year and 10% then the year after that and 10% the year after that. And we're nowhere near doing any of that. So it looks to me as though the lack of action on climate pledges to decrease carbon emissions is not forthcoming. And that means I think we'll be crashing through that 1.5 degrees of warming pledge from Paris sometime in the 20, early 2030s. Uh, it's a disaster we're seeing coming. It's a disaster we're stuck behind the steering wheel of the car watching the wall come towards us. And we need to really increase the pace and do something much more radical. There's plenty of finger-pointing of the leaders who weren't at the summit uh, and those who tried to water down the, the commitments at the very end of the summit. But is the UK itself fully enthusiastic about one of its great opportunities of carbon capture? Is enough being done uh, with the potential that there is off the shores of Scotland in particular? Well, I think that's a great question because the UK is talking a good talk and it's clearly travelling along a route towards greater climate action, but it's not actually matching its talk with its practical actions. And so that what's being ignored at the moment are two other projects in the UK, which have both passed the uh, criteria for success. And one of those is the ACORN project in Scotland, as you and I know very well, which is a very interesting project because 
importantly, it gets access for the first time to about 80% of the different geological varieties of storage in the North Sea. So it opens up a huge realm of opportunity. And even if some of that storage doesn't work technically, then the other parts will, because it's really well understood, really well known from the oil and gas industry, from literally decades and decades of exploration and production work, which the oil and gas industry holds the records of and is accessible for use by carbon dioxide storage developers. So to ignore that at this stage seems a strange way of behaving because that's a really low risk, safe and secure way of developing a carbon storage project. And it also means that you can engage very large parts of the oil and gas, the offshore industry, I should say, really, offshore engineering and construction, which is based around Aberdeen, the east of Scotland, and down into northern England. So it's a way of helping those people with highly skilled jobs to transition into this new green uh, carbon storage, climate-friendly opportunities, which we have in the UK. So are you saying that, ironically perhaps, that the knowledge that's being gained by the extraction of hydrocarbons from the North Sea, that geological knowledge provides perhaps the, the key to, to storing a substantial amount of Europe's carbon dioxide? Yeah, it's really clear that uh, the UK, and in particular the Scottish part of the UK, sits on a huge carbon storage asset, something like uh, half of the carbon dioxide storage in the North Sea is offshore of Scotland. And it's also clear that that North Sea carbon dioxide storage held jointly between Scotland, Norway, and uh, the offshore east of England part of the UK with a little bit in the Irish Sea, that's the storage which is needed for all of Europe. Because many of the uh, nation states in Europe, which are uh, uh, Netherlands, Germany, France, uh, Poland, cannot access huge carbon storage in their own domestic territory. So it's very probable, and it's been planned for many years, in fact, that uh, shipping of carbon dioxide or pipelining of carbon dioxide from those European states can easily come to the North Sea, be accepted by countries like Scotland, the UK, and Norway, and be stored safely and securely deep beneath the North Sea, where it is well understood, geological, safe and secure storage, and where it can be monitored and detected for decades and decades to come to make sure that carbon dioxide is staying exactly where it's been put. So this is a, a continental scale opportunity we have here. So would you say if, if we can learn to look at carbon capture facilities as a resource in the same way as we look at a renewable resource in the, in the North Sea, that might be the, well, the greatest Christmas present that uh, the world has had for some time? I say it's almost a negligent way of behaving to uh, not push ahead with this type of development as fast as possible. It's absolutely clear that just two carbon capture and storage industrial regions are not going to be sufficient to deliver the amount of carbon dioxide and the rate of progress you needed, that's needed. And that's why the Scottish ACORN project opens up so much extra territory. So let's hope the new year grasps that new opportunity. Professor Stuart Hazeldean, thank you so much for joining me once again on The Alex Salmon Show. Pleasure, thank you. Join us after the break when Alex examines how the artistic community are responding to the climate emergency. We'll see you then. Welcome back. In Italy, for 30 years under Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Now, when Orson Welles inserted these very lines as Harry Lyme, the charismatic villain at the heart of the film The Third Man, released in 1949, he almost certainly realised that they would resonate as the classic assertion that times of crisis produce great art. This certainly seems to hold true for climate change, as a deepening crisis has spawned a whole generation of films, documentaries and novels. But how are the music and visual arts helping us to understand the crisis? Alex speaks to two young artists whose work is centred on the environmental emergency. First, Natalia Kapchuk is a London-based artist and environmentalist who uses art to deliver a powerful message about climate change and plastic pollution. While Triple Emmy Award and Classical Brit nominee composer Sarah Class premiered her music at COP26. <laughs> 
26. Natalia Kapchuk, uh, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Hi, Alex. Great to see you and beautiful Christmas tree on the background. <laughs> no, thank you, Natalia. Uh, your, your exhibition, the, the Lost Planet, I mean, does that indicate that the environment is a huge inspiration for your art? Absolutely. I had an amazing show in London in October, and um, uh, it's about the environment, about sustainability, about our beautiful planet. And environment has always been an important topic for me. I've been blessed to be traveling around the world to see the most beautiful and unique part of the world, but the, at the same time, the most destroyed and polluted by humans. And in 2019, I was traveling in Mediterranean, and I was shocked with the amount of plastic I collected at the beaches and the previously beautiful and deserted beaches. And this inspired me to, to create a few artworks related to plastic pollution. And the more I traveled, the more devastation I could see, like wildfires, uh, melting glaciers, oil spills. This was quite shocking to me. And the, the series of my artworks grew and grew to 34 pieces. So each one is about a different part of the world to show the beauty of our flora and fauna, our ecosystems, and at the same time to draw awareness to the planet's supply. And each artwork has a story behind it. But as part of your uh, exhibition in London, you, you hosted the, uh, uh, the talk, the discussion, is this the planet Earth's dying century? So you actually had a, almost an environmental, almost a political discussion as part of your exhibition in visual art. That's an interesting combination. Yes, absolutely. Um, basically, I wanted to maximize the impact of my message on climate, especially because art is such a powerful tool to, to express hard-held views and emotions. And I organized that panel discussion press breakfast where I invited uh, key media and uh, representatives from uh, Plastic Ocean, Earth Watch, Royal Geographic Society, MP, Barry Gardiner. Uh, the panel was hosted by a journalist and BBC presenter, Samantha Siemens. And the topic was broad enough to discuss many issues that the planet is facing at the moment. And um, also, it was held at the, on the eve of COP26, which I think was, was a perfect timing. And Natalia, your exhibition was also illustrated on the Oxford Street 161 to 167 building. I mean, what's it like as a, a visual artist to, to look at your, uh, your artwork being displayed and as tens of thousands of people go by in one of the, the busiest thoroughfares of, uh, of London? It was really, truly unique experience. And I even hosted a small party with my friends. We opened a few bottles of champagne and drinking and people passing by and enjoying the my art. So um, I made it, I created it uh, during the first lockdown. Uh, I was actually pregnant and um, it was a very uncertain time in, and I didn't, it was lots of, uh, mixed feelings about our planet, the future, what are we living for our future generations. And I decided to create this video installation uh, as actually based uh, on Bible chapters from the formation of life on earth to the story of Adam and Eve and uh, followed by money and power uh, oriented human behavior, which uh, eventually leads to six mass ex extinction on Earth. It's a pretty dramatic video, but um, very impactful. My idea was to make uh, the viewers think about uh, um, the future of our planet and to make some changes in their daily life. Well, next time you hold one of these parties, I'll expect a, a, an invite. But the, the medium for your, your work, I mean, you use natural products, uh, wood bark and stone. Uh, how does that translate into the, uh, into the electronic presentation? Um, yeah, actually, I use mixed media. So I use some natural materials and as well as some industrial ones. From natural, for example, sand, fermented moss, um, volcanic stones, which I collect, like from Stromboli volcano, tree bark from Siberia, which I personally uh, collect, or industrial ones, to sh which shows the interconnection of everything in the world, and that we humans we have to be thoughtful while using 
uh, both natural and main made resources. I know you're in Dubai for Expo, President. What's coming up after that? What's coming up next for Natalia Kapchuk? Yes, I'm here and it's Expo. It's an amazing time. I'm bringing a few artworks uh, at Antigua and Barbuda Pavilion. They were very excited when they saw my artworks dedicated to plastic pollution because they are pioneers in marine protection and they uh, said no to using plastic bags and single-use plastic. And I'm bringing a few artworks dedicated to, uh, to this uh, issue, global issue, plastic pollution. Uh, so now at the moment I'm staying here, the expo is still March. So the next step is the exhibition in South Korea in the, one of the museums. And um, as for my video installation, it's traveling around the world. Uh, it will be showcased in France, in Trophy de Acoust and Chateau de Crimon and South of France uh, coming fall. <laughs> Natalia Kapchuk, visual artist extraordinaire. Thank you so much for joining me on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. It was great chatting to you. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah Class, the composer of Rhythm of the Earth. Uh, thank you very much for having me on your show. Now, what's it like to get a, a, a commission like Rhythm of the Earth? I mean, from the Duke of Rossi, Prince Charles. I mean, that must have been quite a moment when you, when you heard you were being signed up to produce that score. Well, it was it was very it was delightful and a great honour. Um, and well, it, it happened because I wrote to him uh, explaining that um, I felt that music, you know, emotion through music can sell the message of conservation. And I, it was a, it was an outpouring in this letter because I heard about Terry Carter, his project. And to my surprise, he wrote back and um, asked me to write this theme. So uh, it was it was amazing. You know, Terry Carter and the Sustainable Markets Initiative is is all about nature and the value of nature. So I felt I could really contribute. So I was so. Delighted when he wrote back, asked for the theme. I just, you know, I, I set about getting something down very quickly. <laughs> Does classical music, in particular, have something to offer a, a theme like the environment? I mean, there's obviously something eternal uh, about the environment. Is there something particular that classical music has to offer? That's a really interesting question because I've always felt that. I mean, I've been exposed to classical music from a very early age, and. I felt that timelessness of it, which is in nature, the two go together. And I think that is the escape for me. Classical music has this endless, infinite, uh, beautiful quality to it that I think I return to as a freedom, a means of escape. And I think nature does that too. So to me, the two things are together. And I, I was brought up that way, you know, loving the woodlands and loving music and marrying the two together. So just let's listen to a, a, a part of Rhythm of the Earth. That's lovely stuff, uh, Sarah, very thought-provoking. Sarah, w one final uh, question. Uh, one of your other glittering uh, achievements this now is the score for the BBC Africa series. And of course, that was fronted by the, the legend, uh, Sir David Attenborough. What's it like working with a, a legend like him? Well, uh, I'm, I think it's, his, it, David is very particular about music. And I think he's, he keeps you on your toes, let me put it like that. I've done a video with him um, and we filmed him as well. And, and I've, I've met him through, through the Worldland Trust quite a few times because he's patron. Um, and I like the fact that he's particular um, and he knows what he wants. So, you know, and he's a very musical person. He plays the piano, um, he has a beautiful grand piano. And so I, I feel, I felt like I, I was definitely, um, I had to I had to stay on my guard and be <laughs> very, very precise. But I know that he liked the music. He loved the music, he said, to BBC Africa. So I was very relieved about that. Um, so, yes, I, I can say that he, he knows what he's talking about. 
He knows what he likes, <laughs> like many people. And Sarah, what, what, what have you got coming up? I, I mean, are you staying on this environmental theme, which is so much part of your music, or, or is it or something else in mind? Well, I've got the um, Resonate album coming out in the beginning of February, and that is that is about the value of nature and the, and the power of music. Um, and uh, also I'm doing a, a, a National Geographic 10-part uh, series. Uh, so that'll be keep me busy for most of the year, I think. So, but, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving all the variety. I think in this one, I think it's a little bit different to your usual orchestral. So, I mean, I do sing a songwriter uh, style music as well, so I like to mix it up a bit, really. Well, we'll look forward to that indeed, Sarah. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining me in the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you so much, Alex. It's a real delight. The UK hosted the summit, which was billed as the last best hope of saving the planet. Some progress was made, but even the most starry-eyed would see it as inadequate to meet the task in hand. Much was made of the countries which did not turn up with top delegations and those which are still determined to water down their climate obligations. And no country does finger pointing better than the UK. However, little notice was taken that the host country itself, in the run up to the summit, watered down its commitment to a technology without which it cannot meet its own climate change targets. By ditching the latest in a long line of Scottish proposals for carbon capture, the Johnson government turned their back on a scheme which could potentially provide a carbon sink for one third of Europe's CO2 emissions. As Stuart Hazeldean argues, not to find out if this dramatic opportunity could actually deliver the hope for outcomes represents folly of the highest order. Indeed, future artists might portray it as history repeating itself, as both farce and tragedy. But now from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs>